the growing trend among a lot of people of taking a small aspirin low dose every day to prevent heart attacks and strokes. Well, today, the Journal of the American Medical Association raised a red flag saying the risk of bleeding even from low dose aspirin every day is greater than they thought and ABC's Dr. Richard Besser is here to explain what this means. This was a big study, Rich. This is this is big. You know, we've known for years that aspirin can cause bleeding, but here they looked at hundreds of thousands of people who were on low dose aspirin because they had risk factors for heart disease like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and they found that the risk of bleeding was five times as great as we originally thought. So aspirin does two things. It can directly irritate your stomach and cause bleeding, and then it prevents that bleeding from stopping. You know, take a look at this. This is the normal situation. If you have a little nick in a blood vessel, the platelets come together with proteins in your blood and form a nice, strong clot. Okay, but if you put aspirin on board, the situation is very different. Those platelets don't come together well. That clot is gonna be weak and leaky. And that blood can leak into your brain or into your intestine, and that can be deadly. So this new study gonna change the recommendation of doctors? Well, I think it will. You know, if you've had a heart attack, continue taking that baby aspirin. It's not gonna change that. But everyone else, I wanna send you back to your doctor to, to talk about this, because it's not so clear that trade-off anymore. Yes, it's so common we forget it's a drug. That's right. It is a drug. Okay, thank you so much, Rich. Salicylic acid, the active ingredient in aspirin, has been used for thousands of years as an anti-inflammatory painkiller in the form of willow tree bark extract, which Hippocrates used to treat fever and to alleviate pain during childbirth. It became trademarked as a drug in 1899, and remains to this day probably the most commonly used drug in the world. One of the reasons it remains so popular, despite the fact that we have better painkillers now, is that it also acts as a blood thinner. Millions of people now take aspirin on a daily basis to treat or prevent heart disease. It all started back in 1953 with the publication of this landmark study in the New England Journal of Medicine, Length of Life and Cause of Death in Rheumatoid Arthritis. The paper started out with the sense it has often been said that the way to a long, live a long life is to acquire rheumatism. They found fewer deaths than expected from accidents, which could be explained by the fact that People with arthritis probably aren't out, you know, going skiing, but also significantly fewer deaths from heart attacks. Uh, maybe it was all the aspirin they were taking for their joints that was thinning their blood and preventing clots forming in their coronary arteries, in their heart. And so in the 1960s, there were calls to study whether aspirin would help those at risk for blood clots, and in the 1970s, we got our wish, studies suggesting regular aspirin intake protects against heart attacks. Today, the official recommendation is that low-dose aspirin is recommended for all patients with heart disease. But in the general population, for those without a known history of heart disease or stroke, daily aspirin is only recommended when the heart disease benefits outweigh the risks of bleeding. The bleeding complications associated with aspirin use may be considered an underestimated hazard in clinical medical practice. For those who've already had a heart attack, the risk-benefit analysis is clear. If you uh, took 10,000 patients, daily low-dose aspirin use would be expected to prevent approximately 250 major vascular events, such as heart attack strokes, or the most major event of all, death. But that same aspirin would be expected to cause approximately 40 major extracranial bleeding events, meaning bleeding so bad you have to be hospitalized. Thus, the net benefit of aspirin for secondary prevention, meaning like preventing your second heart attack, would substantially exceed the bleeding hazard. For every six major vascular events prevented, only about one major bleeding event would occur, so the value of aspirin for secondary prevention is not disputed. But if you instead took 10,000 patients who had never had a heart attack or stroke yet, and tried to use aspirin to prevent clots in the first place, so-called primary prevention, Daily low-dose aspirin would only be expected to prevent seven major vascular events at the cost of causing a hemorrhagic stroke, bleeding within the brain, along with three other major bleeding events. So then the benefits are only like two to one. It's a little too close for comfort, which is why the new European guidelines do not recommend aspirin for the general population, especially given the additional risk of aspirin calling, causing smaller bleeds within the brain as well. If only there were a safe, simple, side-effect-free solution. And there is. Ornish and Esselstyn proved that even advanced crippling heart disease could not only just be prevented and treated, but reversed with a plant-based diet. 
centered around grains, beans, vegetables, fruits with nuts and seeds treated as condiments, and no oils, dairy, meat, poultry, or fish. Bill Castelli, a longtime director of the longest-running epidemiological study in the world, the famous Framingham Heart Study, was once asked what he would do to reverse the coronary artery disease epidemic if he were omnipotent. His answer? Have the public eat the diet described by Dr. T. Colin Campbell. In other words, he told PBS, if Americans ate healthy enough, the whole heart disease epidemic would disappear. Though Esselstyn clarifies, uh, we're not just talking about vegetarianism. This new paradigm of heart disease reversal means exclusively plant-based nutrition. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Heart Disease. This is Dr. Dwight Lindell. I'm delighted to have you with us. Next is from Mrs. Williams. We believe your recommendations save my husband from the side effects of statins. He is active, has excellent blood pressure, but his cardiologist is concerned his cholesterol is 202. I began investigating and found you. He is now almost 70 and still doing well. Do you think he needs to take statins? Mrs. Williams, absolutely not. Once again, there is no evidence that anyone over 65 has ever benefited in any way from taking a statin medication. There is also no evidence that a cholesterol of 202 means anything. The amusing thing about this is we think we're doing some good by treating a cholesterol level, and really it's like saying we're putting out a fire by waving the smoke away. Mike P. writes in, I had a carotid artery surgery a while back, and I understand from my doctor that I must take statins for the remainder of my life. I did not see any direct mention of statin use and cholesterol in the book. If there is some reference to this, I would be very interested. Do you think I need statins because of the carotid artery surgery? The answer, Mike, is no. Although the makers of statins have tried to do studies demonstrating that they can arrest the growth or reduce the growth of the plaques in arteries, none have been successful. They have not succeeded in stopping the growth of plaque or reversing the growth of plaque. There was a couple of studies that were widely touted saying that they slowed the growth, but that was all very dubious and based on some very slim evidence in my opinion. Once again, Mike, there's not any evidence anywhere that taking a statin will change anything about your carotid artery. You're exposing yourselves to unnecessary side effects of statin medications without the hope of any benefit at all. No matter where we live, how old we are, what we look like, health researchers have discovered that 90% of having a first heart attack can be attributed to nine modifiable risk factors. The nine factors that are threatening our lives include smoking, too much bad cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, abdominal obesity, stress, a lack of daily fruit and vegetable consumption, as well as a lack of daily exercise. But Dr. William Clifford Roberts, executive director of the Baylor Heart and Vascular Institute and longtime editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Cardiology, is convinced that atherosclerosis has a single cause, namely the cholesterol and that the other so-called atherosclerotic risk factors are only contributory at most. In other words, we could be stressed, overweight, smoking, diabetic, couch potatoes, but if our cholesterol is low enough, there may be just not enough cholesterol in our bloodstream to infiltrate our artery walls and trigger the disease. Thus, the only absolute prerequisite for a fatal or non-fatal atherosclerotic event like a heart attack is an elevated cholesterol level. It was not appreciated until recently that the average blood cholesterol level in the United States, the so-called normal level, was actually abnormal, accelerating the blockages in our arteries and putting a large fraction of the normal population at risk. It's our number one killer. Uh, that cited is one of the reasons the cholesterol controversy lasted for so long, an unwillingness to accept the notion that a very large fraction of our population actually has an unhealthily high cholesterol level. Normal cholesterol levels may be terminal cholesterol levels. The optimal cholesterol level, the optimal bad cholesterol LDL level, is 50 to 70. Accumulating data from multiple lines of evidence consistently demonstrate that that's where a physiologically normal LDL level would be. That appears to be the threshold above which atherosclerosis and heart attacks develop. That's what we start out at birth with. That's what our fellow primates have. That's the level seen in populations free of the heart disease epidemic. But we can also look at all the big randomized controlled cholesterol-lowering trials. This is graphing the progression of atherosclerosis versus LDL cholesterol. More cholesterol, more atherosclerosis. But if you draw a line down through the points, you can estimate that the LDL level at which there is zero progression is down around an LDL cholesterol of 70. 
You can do the same with studies preventing heart attacks in the first place. Zero coronary heart disease events might be reached down around 55, and those who've already had a heart attack and trying to prevent a second one might need to push their LDL levels even lower. Atherosclerosis is endemic in our population in part because the average person's LDL cholesterol is up around 130, approximately twice the normal physiologic level. The reason the federal government doesn't recommend everyone shoot for at least even just under 100 is that despite the lower risk accompanying more optimal cholesterol levels, the intensity of clinical intervention required to achieve such levels for everyone in the population would financially overload the healthcare system. Drug usage would rise enormously. But they're assuming drugs are the only way to get our LDL that low. But those eating really plant-based diets may hit the optimal cholesterol target without even trying, just naturally nailing under 70. The reason given by the federal government for not advocating what the science shows is best was that it might frustrate the public, who would have difficulty maintaining a lower level. But maybe the public's greatest frustration would come from not being informed of the optimal diet for health. We have all been taught to fear and dread cholesterol. Cholesterol for 40 years has been our enemy. And when your blood cholesterol is elevated, we have been taught to be concerned. Starting about three years ago, I noticed a progressive deterioration of muscle function. My muscles were weak, my muscles were sore, and, my, uh, and I lacked coordination, I lacked balance. And I realized, because I'm getting in a steady flood of complaints from other statin victims, I realized that I was just like many of these other cases. And then John Edwards of the World Health Association reported in safety, Drug Safety magazine uh, journal uh, two years ago, 2007 in August, that there's an increase, uh, there's excessive numbers of ALS cases with statin users worldwide. And this made me realize that I was getting ALS-like conditions associated with statin use. And it was apparent to me, it was also apparent to World Health Organization, but our own FDA is still in denial. Subsequently, I have found out just recently that over 1,000 cases of TGA have been reported to FDA via MedWatch, which is their formal system, and yet, and that's from Lipitor alone, and yet not one word of this has been given to the medical community. I am really disturbed over that because it makes it so difficult to try to uh, advise doctors. And you go in their office and they said, I've never heard of that. And I was on board ship uh, last year and a, a, a professor of cardiology giving a talk to other doctors for continuing with medical education. He was talking on statin use. He'd never heard of this before. And that was last year. This is FDA's fault. They're sitting on this. And all the statin drugs do it. There are thousands of cases. And for every case of amnesia, you'll get hundreds of cases of simple confusion, disorientation, uh, extreme forget forgetfulness, as well as dementia. So all of these are in the, uh, in the cognitive category. We have the Medicus Index where you take this big book, you look up a subject, and then you find where the articles were published. I would spend, you know, I would spend hours every day, because it was right on the grounds of the Queen's Medical Center where I was doing my residency, hours every day looking through the Medicus Index, and because copies were 10 cents a copy at the library, I had to take him over to the hospital, which was oh, probably 300 yards away with a hand truck. And there are still breaks in the steps of the library that I put there from banging the hand truck on the, on the steps. So I started reading the literature with passion, and I, I'll tell you one reason why. It's because power in medicine comes from knowledge. If you're a banker, it's how much money you got. If you're a real estate agent, it's how much land you own. If you're a physician, it's how much you know. And so I wanted to win the game, just like everybody does. And so I just put chip after chip after chip in my bank, which is the scientific literature. Now, not only did I get excited about diet, and I didn't even know if I wanted to be a doctor at that time. This is my residency. I, I was still floundering around thinking, is this my, my place? Not only did I get excited about nutrition, 
and health, but I wanted to know everything every other doctor knew. I wanted to know everything about bypass surgery, everything about chemotherapy, everything about MS drug treatment. I wanted to know everything so that when I sat down with the experts, the world experts, they would sit down with me and we'd have a conversation. About 10 minutes into it, they'd look at me and they'd say, you know as much about this as I do. And I would say, of course I do, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. And that's what I encourage every other young doctor, every other doctor who wants to take this serious, is not only do you don't have to know the facts about the human diet, you must know everything your opponents or your friends or whatever you want to call them, everything they know. Otherwise, they'll dismiss you. Oh, you don't even know that heart surgery doesn't save lives. You're a pretty stupid guy. I'm not going to listen to your food garbage. You've got to know it all. So that's why I became passionate. Uh, I did. I collected uh, files and files of relative scientific information. Of course, I don't do that anymore. I just store them on my computer. But yeah, that's, that's what you could say about me. And I still, I read a few more novels, very selectively. Well, it is Jen. You Ari, and today we're going to learn how not to die. And the person keeping us alive with the How Not to Die cookbook, Dr. Michael Greger. Nice to see you. Hi. That's a... Quite, quite, yep. <laughs> quite a mission. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Well, no, it's not how to not die, but how not to die. Okay. How not to God. die. Prematurely. Okay, and let prematurely. me ask you this. We go to all this work. Yeah. We follow your recipes. Yeah. And we get hit by a bus coming home from the health food store. You, then what happens? You still have Dead to, as a doornail. You still have to look both ways. <laughs> still got to wear your bike helmet, right. seat belts, I'm, fire alarms. Okay. It's not fine. the right. Fine, fine. But you're yeah. saying you don't have to clean out your pantry or your refrigerator, but you should add these things in. Oh, well, that's your what program, I found in my right? patient population. So people don't like foods being taken away from them. So I came up with kind of a daily dozen checklist of all the healthiest of healthy foods. I encourage them to start adding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to their diets to try to crowd out some of the least healthy options. Okay. Let's walk through it. What are we doing? There's a whole bunch here. Yeah. Berries, for example. Berries, that's the brain food. Harvard mm. researchers found that one serving of blueberries, two servings of strawberries a day, may be able to slow brain aging by as much as two and a half years, less stroke and heart attack risk. And so you say, wait a second, tastes great, and you get to live longer. That's what plant-based right. eating is all about. <laughs> You'll be more cognizant when your ingrate children don't visit you in the home. What? <laughs> Next. You'll see the bus coming. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> All right. What's next? Oh, we have oh, uh, ground flax seeds. Just a few spoonfuls of ground flax seeds a day can lower blood pressure two to three times better than the leading blood pressure drug and only has good side effects, reducing inflammation, curing constipation, reducing breast and prostate cancer risk. A tablespoon of ground flax seeds a day, that'd be my recommendation. Okay. A tablespoon a day. Okay, got it. Absolutely. Now what? Whole grains. We got whole grains. That's where the bulk of our uh, of our energy should come from. Greens are the healthiest vegetables, right. and the healthiest types of greens are the cruciferous greens, the broccoli family mm. vegetables, like kale and collard greens. Mm. But cabbage also fits into that uh, family, and those purple and red cabbages have those same special eyesight and brain protective antioxidants that the berries do, but at a fraction of the cost. Huh. These are the healthiest possible snacks. The famous Even with the fat content, it's okay to well, eat a lot of them? It's where the fat comes from. We're talking about whole food sources of fat. So flax seeds, so nuts, seeds, avocados, that's where we should get our nutrition from. Mm. Famous Pretty Med study found that just a single palm full of nuts every day for a few years cuts stroke risk in half. Is there a healthy nut? Because Gelman is always, he thinks he's got the healthiest nuts, but I don't think his nuts are that healthy. <laughs> he does talk about it quite a bit, doctor. Walnuts are the healthiest nuts. High okay. is omega-3 content. Yeah. Okay. There. And it, then we're rewarded with a, a libation at the end. Indeed. Yeah. Herbal tea called hibiscus. Mm. Tested head-to-head -head against the leading blood pressure drug. Two cups of hibiscus tea every morning can lower blood pressure. It's as good as the drug. Yeah. I did not Without know that. The, though it is, they don't call it sour tea for nothing. Anytime we eat something acidic like citrus, we should rinse our mouth out with water just to prevent the natural acids from hurting our neighbor. Oh. We're going to live okay. forever. Hi, I'm Dr. John McDougall. I'm a medical doctor, and uh, I describe myself as the luckiest doctor in the world. The reason is, is my patients get well. 
Now, when I was a younger doctor, before I discovered the things that I know now, some of my patients got well, those who had acute problems. Yeah, I could, I could intervene as a medical doctor and I could uh, lance their abscesses when they had an infection and put them on antibiotics and made a difference. I could uh, sew up their wounds when they cut themselves. I could straighten their bones and put them in a cast. I could make a difference. And I felt like a, an important doctor. You liked me also because I intervened and helped you heal quicker and better. That's the purpose of a doctor. It's, it's to help other people. But that's a small category of disease that doctors help in, and that's acute problems due to single injuries like the cut, like the break, like that attack by the bacteria, single injuries. And there we can intervene and make a difference. But most people, they don't suffer, go to the doctor with acute problems. They go with chronic problems, chronic diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, chronic constipation, chronic indigestion, chronic arthritis. It goes on and on and on and on. Just by definition, chronic, it gets worse. How would you expect a doctor to make a difference? The doctor can't make a difference by intervening in a disease that's labeled as chronic. Well, that's not entirely true. You can make a difference in chronic disease. But you have to do it with a different kind of intervention. You have to correct the problem. You have to correct the multiple injuries. Remember, the acute disease is a single injury, a cut, a break. Multiple injuries cause chronic diseases. Day after day after day, the body is injured, and it tries to recover. It tries to heal. It just can't keep up. Like, for example, a cigarette smoker. They keep coughing and coughing and coughing because of that repeated injury, and there is a cure. And you know what it is, and I'm not even going to say it. It's the same thing with uh, dietary diseases like heart disease and obesity and constipation and indigestion and arthritis and so on and so on. Yeah, the doctor could intervene, but it has to be done a big, big step back. And that big step back is, uh, is the step of stopping the repeated injury. That's that fork and spoon that shovels the fat and cholesterol in the mouth and in the body. That's, that's the source of the repeated injuries. You stop that, the body does what it's always been doing, always been doing, which is healing. It's just now it can outpace the injury and you heal and the diseases go away. Yeah, you know, talking to every doctor out there listening, I wanna tell you, you wanna be the kind of doctor you went to medical school for, the kind of doctor that makes a big difference in people's lives? Teach your patients to stop the repeated injuries. That'll make the difference. And they'll love you. I'm Dr. John McDougall. High blood pressure is the number one risk factor for death in the world, affecting nearly 78 million Americans. Uh, that's one in three adults. And as we age, our pressures get higher and higher, such that by age 60, it strikes more than half. Well, if it affects most of us when we get older, uh, maybe it's less a disease, more just an inevitable consequence of aging. No, we've known since the 1920s that high blood pressure need not occur. Researchers measured the blood pressure of 1,000 people in rural Kenya who ate a diet centered around whole plant foods, whole grains, beans, vegetables, fruit, and dark grain leafies. Our pressures go up as we age. Their pressures actually go down. And the lower, the better. The whole 140 over 90 cutoff is arbitrary. Even people who start out with blood pressures under 120 over 80 appear to benefit from blood pressure reduction. If you went to your doctor with a blood pressure 120 over 80, you'd get a gold star, but the ideal blood pressure, the no benefit from reducing it further blood pressure, may actually be 110 over 70. 110 over 70? Is it even possible to get blood pressures down that low? It's not just possible, it's normal for those eating healthy enough diets. For two years at a rural Kenyan hospital, 1,800 patients were admitted. How many cases of high blood pressure did they find? Zero. Wow, they must have had low rates of heart disease. Uh, no, they had no rates of heart disease. Not a single case of arteriosclerosis, our number one killer was found. Rural China, too. About 110 over 70 their entire lives, 70-year-olds with the same average blood pressure as 16-year-olds. Now, Africa, China, vastly different diets, but what they shared in common is that they were plant-based day-to-day with meat only eaten on special occasions. Now, why do we think it's the plant-based nature of their diets that was so protective? Because in the Western world, as the American Heart Association has pointed out, the only folks really getting it down that low were those eating strictly plant-based diets, coming in at about 110 over 65. This is the largest study of those eating plant-based diets to date, 89,000 Californians, uh, comparing non-vegetarians to so-called semi-vegetarians or, or flexitarians, eating meat more on a weekly basis than a daily basis, 
compared to those who eat no meat except fish, uh, compared to those who eat no meat at all, compared to those who eat no meat, eggs, or dairy. Uh, now, this was an Adventist study, so even the non-vegetarians didn't eat a lot of meat, and they tended to eat lots of fruits and vegetables, and exercised, and you know, not smoke. And so even compared to a group of relatively healthy meat eaters, there appeared to be a stepwise drop in hypertension rates as people ate more and more plant-based. Same thing with diabetes and obesity. Uh, so yes, we can wipe out most of our risk eating strictly plant-based, but, but it's not all or nothing. It's not black or white. Any movement along this spectrum towards eating healthier can accrue significant health benefits. You can show this experimentally. You take vegetarians, you give them meat, and pay them enough to eat it, and their blood pressures go up. Or you remove meat from people's diets, and blood pressures go down in just seven days. And this is after the vast majority reduced or stopped their blood pressure medications completely. Uh, they had to stop their medications. Once you treat the cause, once you eliminate the disease, you can't be on blood pressure pills with normal blood pressure. You can drop your pressures too low, get dizzy, fall over, hurt yourself. So your doctor has to pull you off the pills. Lower pressures on fewer drugs. That's the power of plants. So, uh, does the American Heart Association recommend a no-meat diet? Uh, no, they recommend a low-meat diet, the so-called DASH diet. Uh, why not completely plant-based? Uh, when the DASH diet was being created, were they just not aware of this landmark research done by Harvard's Frank Sachs? Uh, no, they were aware. The chair of the design committee that came up with the DASH diet was Frank Sachs. See, the DASH diet was explicitly designed with the number one goal of capturing the blood pressure-lowering benefits of a vegetarian diet, yet contain enough animal products to make it palatable to the general population. Uh, they didn't think the public could handle the truth. Now, in their defense, you can see what they were thinking. I mean, just like drugs never work unless you actually take them, diets never work unless you actually eat them. So they're like, look, no one's going to eat strictly plant-based. So if they soft-pedaled the message and came up with some kind of compromised diet, then maybe on a population scale they'd do more good. Okay, tell that to the thousand American families a day that lose a loved one to high blood pressure. Maybe it's time to start telling the American public the truth. Well, it's always good to talk to you. I'm Dr. John McDougall, and I'm trying to convey some really important quick messages to you about the way I practice medicine. Now, you can confirm all this initially by going to my website and reading the articles that I've written. Go to Hot Topics and read about, for example, hypertension, high blood pressure. And you as the consumer, you ought to be able to delve into this and to discover what's important and what is true for you. I mean, after all, let's think about this. You are the consumer. You are ultimately the person who benefits or is harmed most by this advice and the decisions that follow. Yeah, your, your doctor might feel bad if heart surgery is botched. Sure. You know, in fact, your doctor might feel real bad if your relatives come and sue your doctor. That would be terrible. But, I mean, who pays most? You and your family by these decisions. And how many people really look into it? as to whether what they're doing is right or wrong. Not many, they believe their doctor. After all, their doctor is next to God, not to be questioned. But would you take that attitude if you went to buy a car? Would you walk onto the used car or new car showroom and say, whatever you want, just, just yeah, fine. Uh, where do I sign? Uh, you want me to pay that much? Well, I'd be happy to pay that much for it. I'm not gonna argue, I'm not gonna bargain, I'm not gonna investigate, just sell me whatever car that you think is best, or a refrigerator. Of course you wouldn't. But what's more important, your life, your spouse's life, your children's life, or, or buying a TV set? It's time to be a good consumer. But I tell my patients, I, I tell them, if you're gonna go see a doctor, then uh, 10 minutes before you enter the office, sit in your car and practice saying, no, 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 so that when you, when you get in the doctor's office, the doctor says you've got to take a lifetime of diabetic pills, lifetime of blood pressure pills, you've got to have heart surgery next Tuesday afternoon. It just kind of rolls right off your lips. No, no, thank you. You know, even a prisoner gets one phone call. Get out of the office. Start investigating. Be a good consumer. Your life depends on it. I'm Dr. John McDougall. When you open the door on your waiting room tomorrow morning, 
the vast majority of people in those benches waiting to see you are there because they're sick from what they've been eating, the standard Western meat and dairy-based diet. Um, a plant-based diet is the key to true prevention and treatment of these diseases. 